Well, hello and welcome to everyone that has joined our final book club session. Uh, today, we are here with Dr. June Johnson uh, discussing Salvage the Bones. Um, so I do want to start by just talking through a few logistical items as we get started. We are recording the session. If you do not wish to be recorded, um, please keep your webcam off. Um, we also ask that you keep your microphone muted and only come off mute when you want to participate in the conversation. Captions have been enabled and you can turn them on and off using the Zoom control panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we do encourage you to join in on the conversation. If you'd like to participate, you can use the raise your hand feature that's in the Zoom control panel, or you can also visually raise your hand as well. And um, my colleague, Kate Owen and I would be monitoring that. The chat feature is also on. So if you would like to post a question or a comment in the chat, you can do that too. And with that said, I am very excited to introduce our host for today, Dr. June Johnson. June is an associate professor of English, director of writing studies and writing consultant to the university core at Seattle University. She has her BA in English, an MA in education from Stanford and an MA in English from Mills College. After chairing the English department of a preparatory school in Los Angeles and working as a development editor in educational publishing, she earned her PhD from the University of Washington. At Seattle University, she teaches and supervises the teaching of first year academic writing seminars. She also teaches advanced argument and composition theory in the writing studies minor. June is the co-author with John Bean of Thinking Rhetorically, A Guide to College Writing, formerly the Allen and Bacon Guide to Writing, which is in a new edition this year. And she is also a co-author on Writing Arguments. June, thank you so much for joining us today and for leading our discussion. Thank you for that, for that invitation, for that for introduction. Um, I'm excited to hear people's responses to this novel, which I become more and more impressed with as the more times I read it. Uh, I'd like to start out first by asking how many people are teachers here? Can I get an indication of who is a teacher? Kate or Rachel, do you have any way of, um, okay, looks like I, hands raised or something I don't know who is well um, people can use the zoom controls if they don't want to um, come off camera um, to do that and give us a thumbs up I think we still have some more people that are joining the room too okay June. Strucker Santa Monica College okay great thank you Sarah that sounds interesting um, you're welcome. <laughs> I know Santa Monica. That's where I, I taught down there in the private school. So um, Windward School. Anybody else who wants to? I'm, I'm also curious who is uh, who has taught any texts of climate fiction? Or, or are you a reader of climate fiction? No? Okay. Um, how about who has um, read other books by Jessamyn Ward? Do we have any? What are we seeing in the chat? Anything? Um, okay, Rachel, you're first. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to start out with a really quick introduction. Um, um, I, and let's go back to my questions, I guess. Uh, my questions. My opening questions that Rachel had up, um, we're going to be looking at uh, Ward's complex and ambivalent portrayal of uh, motherhood, the multiple mother figures, which I'm sure um, came to your attention probably fairly early in reading this text. Um, the meaning, symbolism, and symbolism of the title and the words salvage and bones, 
both are very haunting words and they when you start looking for them um, they pop up all throughout the text um, the narrative techniques for humanizing the people of Bois Sauvage, Mississippi, that um, Justin Ward uses, and the themes of friends, family, and community, the theme of in the face of suffering and loss, and finally, um, the question, is salvage the bones as a work of climate uh, fiction. Um, I taught this book in a class um, on climate fiction. All the writers were people of color, and the class, um, the students responded very, very well to that. And I will talk maybe at the end a little bit more about, about that. Um, let's just oh, let's just review a couple of facts about um, Jessamyn Ward. Um, she is quite remarkable. Um, she uh, did her, she grew up in Delille, uh, Mississippi. And I'm gonna show you a, a, a picture, a map of that in just a few minutes. And she um, went to a private school. She went to Stanford. Um, she got her BA and her MA from Stanford, in, um, MA in communication media. Then she got her um, MFA from the University of Michigan. And one thing that's truly remarkable about her is that she's won the National Book Award twice. She won it for, um, for Salvage the Bones and she won it for her more recent book, um, her 2017 book, um, Sing, Unburied Sing, which I did read this summer, and it's a fabulous piece, um, a compliment to um, Salvage the Bones, but, but still a different story. Same, same setting, I think a little bit like Faulkner. She has her fictional setting that she um, taps because she wants other, other people to understand that region of the country. She also won in 2017, she won a MacArthur Award. And um, the, the popular title for that is a Genius Award. But she's, so she's clearly um, gaining lots and lots of attention and rightfully so. And she is a professor, associate professor at Tulane um, teaching creative writing. So, okay, what I thought I would do is um, uh, just, I, when I'm approaching a novel, I like to give it some kind of um, literary context, a critical context. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to just walk through a few articles. Um, I've, I've summarized these. Um, if you started checking, you know there's a lot of material out there on her. P people are beginning to, to write about her and her, her, her works. So I'm going to share this. Okay, um, can everybody see that? Um, this is a sampling of some literary critical context and interpretive frames. How have scholars and this uh, critics placed the novel in traditions of Southern literature, in African American literature? Uh, what social narratives does it participate in, and what Katrina narratives does it talk back to? So um, I found that this was really helpful for me. It just was provocative and interesting. So this article by Christopher Clark, What Comes to the Surface, Storms, Bodies, and Community in Justman Ward, Salvage the Bones, uh, published in the Mississippi Quarterly in a special uh, edition, a volume. Um, when I have my students summarize articles, I don't let them quote as much as this, but I thought I'd give you a taste of these critics. Clark explores how embodiment figures in the novel and how human and non-human bodies manifest regional stories, playing an important role alongside particular racialized histories of the South. He writes that the novel's geography evokes a deeply embedded history of racism. The rising waters that engulf the landscape figuratively drown it in the past, and the throwaway bodies left behind recall other victims of racial violence. Clark points out that Ward depicts the land as injured bodies and waste. He argues that Ward acknowledges one dimensional prejudices, um, that she's talking back to these, while creating complex characters that challenge stereotypes, for instance, through the bonds of family and friends. He finds hope in the open-ended conclusion that renders this new space clearly marked by its origins, yet open to new possibilities affirming that Black Southerners will continue to join together and survive. So my questions are 
quite in line with this article, although I created the questions before I actually read the article, uh, but I think that's a really interesting piece. Um, Moyna Han, um, her article, or this article from Disposability to Recycling, William Faulkner, Faulkner and the New Politics of Rewriting in Justman Ward's Salvage the Bones. And this is from Studies in the Novel. Focusing on Esch's study of Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, as well as numerous similarities and differences from Faulkner's novel, Moynihan reads Salvage the Bones intertextually, arguing that the novel represents a new form of Peter Widowson's revisionary fiction, which Moynihan calls recycling. Instead of following a conservative pattern of reinscribing the canonical text, Ward's novel engages in an act of rewriting that places the social present on an equal footing with the literary past. In her echoes of Faulkner's novel, Ward's depiction of the relationship between waste, poverty, and motherhood engages with a co contemporaneous discourse in which African-American single mothers are consigned to the category of waste. This reading of the novel through the interpretive lens of a new form of revisionary fiction that engages more emphatically than previous modes of rewriting in a critique of contemporary socio-political realities places the text in literary history and illuminates Ward's aesthetic depth and social justice, um, her social justice project. So probably for you, I would imagine that when you read uh, some scholarly criticism, it, it may open up some new ways of looking at the text. And I uh, um, I didn't want to go into a whole Faulkner approach, but I think this is a, this is interesting because it does focus on how she's interacting and bringing the, the contemporary into this tradition. Another article, um, did I skip one? No. Um, Crawford's Where Everything Else is Starving, Fighting, Struggling, Food and the Politics of Hurricane Katrina and Justin Ward Salvage the Bones from Southern Quarterly. I found this one really, really interesting. Crawford locates Ward's novel within Southern and African American food ways, exploring food insecurity as a class and racial marker tied to the lingering effects of the 19th century slave economy. He writes that Ward's novel falls in line with the tradition of African-American literature, wherein food becomes a means of resistance and empowerment. Crawford reads Ash's food imagery and metaphors with which she describes her body and sexuality and the bodies of her family members in terms of food that is expensive and special. And I don't know if you picked up on this, but this article helped me zero in on a little bit more. Um, candy, chocolates, rich pies, fresh food, as um, these, these are the metaphors that Esch uses as an act of resistance, a rebellion, a rebellion by which she claims her sexuality and humanity. Similarly, Crawford notes that Ward's, Ward counters stereotypes and adds dimensions to the images of Black men by depicting the role that Randall plays in food preparation and Skeeta plays in providing food for China as a rewriting of Black masculinity and gender roles. I think you could have a really long, you could have a long conversation about um, Ward's portrayal of masculinity. It's yeah, to me, it's fascinating how how much those um, young men are uh, taking very different roles. Okay, so now I would like to, before we go into a discussion, I'm going to stop that for a minute. Um, I'd like to talk just a little bit about context, um, probably. Um, all of you are fairly familiar with um, with the Katrina narratives and with that that disaster. Um, it was a August 29th, 2005. Um, it was Category Five storm. It grew as the novel shows us. It went from Category Three to Category Five. Um, it had, had winds of 125 miles per hour, and it. Um, the fatalities, 1,392 fatalities. I think what's most interesting about um, the Katrina narratives are the way that they um, continue to uh, blame the victims and criminalize the African-American population. Um, and the narratives in New Orleans focused a lot about looting and, and shooting and and missed the kind of seemed to miss the whole point and, and distracted everybody and really exposed the, the, the racism and the structural problems um, with racism. And 
the um, what's interesting is a lot of Katrina narratives are are centered in New Orleans, and that's not what um, Ward wanted to do. She wanted to focus on uh, the Mississippi, rural Mississippi, the Gulf there, people who could couldn't leave, um, who didn't have the means, the resources to leave, and that that was really um, she wants to. That's her humanizing of them. Um, I'm going to now show, I'm going to show you where this is. Okay, where is this? Okay. I did put those up. That's weird. Okay, I'll, I'll go look for that. Uh, I have some, I have a, I thought I had, where is it? Here it is. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess you can't see that. Let's see. Figure out how to share that. I wanted to show you. Oh no. I wanted to show you where um, this was because Delille is uh, is her home and Bois Sauvage is her fictional version of that. And um, why does this? Okay, here it is. Great. Okay, can everybody see is this big enough? Can people see? Um, this is the Mississippi coast and Delil is right in here. And I think what surprised everybody is that um, Delil is, or that Bois Sauvage is not right on the coast. It is on this big bayou of the Bay um, of St. Louis. And so, um, and it's on a river and both drain into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and this area is known for its abundance of kudzu, pine, oak trees, a mixture of thick woods, stagnant bayous, open meadows, a very small population, 1,712. <laughs> Problem is there's not much employment in this area besides farming. And if you recall that, um, uh, that Esh's grandfather was selling parts of their dirt, their land, and that kind of made it um, not, not adequate for farming. So that's another, and I suppose they really needed the money. So, um, okay, I wanna look at one more thing. This is quite interesting. This is what the, um, oh, this cat, this lists higher num number of fatalities, and this is what it looked like. So this is what uh, the, the town would have looked like when, when um, Big Henry drives the Batiste family, the, the children, the kids, to go look. Um, you can see this total wreckage, just complete, complete wreckage. Okay, I want to go back now to our questions. Um, so this novel, the structure, you probably picked up on it really fast. It's 12 days and it covers the lead up to the hurricane. It also, um, the kind of the day after, the first person narrator, Esh, is really, is really significant. And I want to talk about that. I'd be interested in your responses to that. Um, the fact that Esh is, is educated, is smart, um, She's a strong student and she clearly um, engages with intellectual emotional content as in her reading of, of the uh, Greek myths. Um, the other big feature that you probably felt as you read and I'd be interested in your response, the very ominous sense that something is bearing down on them, the intensity of that. And I don't know about you, but I read faster and faster <laughs> and it just, the, it was very um, in, in intense, and it becomes clear that that the Hurricane Katrina is the main antagonist, um, um, or one of the main at least becomes takes a bigger role. Okay, I would now like to talk about. Um, let's go back to my questions, um, and I would. I'm very interested in your response, and we have a small group, so that may be great. So my first question focuses on Jessman Ward, um, how she portrays motherhood. It's clearly very complex. There's a lot of ambivalence, but let's just look at all the mothers in this text. Um, China, um, uh, is this showing, is my screen showing with my full questions, Rachel, or not? 
don't know if the full thing is showing. Um, okay, wait a minute. Sorry, June, I was on, on mute. Can you hear me? I'm I'm trying to share them right now. Can you see them yet? I, I, I want the full questions, if I can. Can we do the full? Um, um, my full ones. Remember the... Yes, there we go. Great. Good. No, okay. I want to... Keep okay. going? Yes. I want to get to the discussion question so we can start our, our discussion with this. Okay, there yeah. we go. No, one more. There we go. Okay. Um, so we have um, China, um, the pit bull. Um, we have Mama, who is the absent and present mother. Esh's grandmother, Mother Elizabeth. Medea, Esh, um, Miss Bernadine, who is Big Henry's mother. And then Mother Nature, Hurricane Katrina. So all these images of motherhood. And they seem to intersect and mirror, complement, contradict each other. Let's look at that. And then um, tied up in this is the whole image of motherhood and how this text talks back to the cultural narratives of young unwed African and mother, African American mothers. And what is Ward doing with that? And so how is she her treatment of motherhood contributing to her overall social and aesthetic project in the novel? So would anybody like to share a little bit about your response to any of these characters? I also have these, these particular passages um, um, highlighted that we could we could check out. Um, the, the passage when mama catches the shark, that's in chapter five, that's in the um, salvage the bones chapter. Um, would anyone like to comment on why you thought that was so interesting or important and how it contributes to this portrayal of motherhood? Well, I'll start the conversation, June. Um, I, I felt like throughout the novel, every time she reflected on her own mother. It was um, a happy memory and a warm memory that seemed to be in, in contrast with the other things that were going on in present, um, in present day. Mm -hmm. um, and with regards to catching the shark, specifically, she's, I guess maybe that speaks to that food element that your other reviewer was talking about too. Mm -hmm. um, she spent a lot of time talking about how long it took to catch the shark and how patient her mother was and how carefully it was prepared. And then she made that comment that um, there were no bones in what they ended up mm -hmm. eating, that it was a very special meal. Okay, those are, that's terrific. Those are great details. Um, did you think that the image of Mama working that shark back and forth, not relinquishing her rod to the other men around, to her, to Daddy, to her husband, um, what did that indicate about Mama? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Um, maybe that not only that she was patient in doing it, but that she had her own opinion too, and was strong about her method for catching the fish. Yeah, I think that um, part of what's going on here is that in, in this text, we get these images of strength, motherhood is strength. And the, um, I think that was, that was part of that, but I'm glad you mentioned the, the preparation of the food. That was, um, I think that's really interesting. Um, China, uh, the pit bull, is um, a very complex image of motherhood. And the fact that she's compared, uh, treated almost in human terms throughout this text. Um, she is in this, on page 129, this is the page where she attacks her puppy and um, basically crunches him, um, kills him. And so we don't really know exactly why she did that. It looked like he was trying to move toward her food, but um, uh, would anyone like to comment on China as a, did you see her as um, a sympathetic character, um, if you can sympathize with a dog, um, 
as a intriguing character or let's say how was she a complex character i can um jump in here hi everyone I'm hi, Kristen. Hi, <laughs> um I, I was just thinking of the passage that comes later where um you know, there's the kind of argument between the father and Skeeta about, you know, the dog being in the house and um, at certain, I think towards the end too, something like, you know, um, her other brother says something, you know, we're not dogs. Um, so I think it's interesting the way that China is both her substitute mother figure, and yet there are also points that complicate the connection between the sort of animality um, and the negative connotations, particularly um, for Black folks and um, animals. And so I, you know, I think that's part of the, I guess that's part of the complexity, um, which is then, um, you know, the extreme whiteness of China too. So those are just some initial thoughts um, based on what you've been talking about. Thanks for that. Did, uh, anyone want to add to the, the the relationship between China and Skeeta is um, perplexing, I think. Um, um, in some cases, sometimes they're like, almost like he's their lovers, kind of. Um, he's a parent. He's a father sharing this litter of puppies with her. Um, they're certainly very close. Um, he's her companion. Um, he responds to her. He, um, what did anyone have a thought about why she, why Ward makes that bond so strong between, um, and how does that further kind of humanize uh, China? Um, I like the fact you mentioned bringing her into the house, Kristen. That was really a good point and how daddy didn't want her in there but um uh, Skeeta was insistent um I, some of the who, who would like to talk who somebody's going to say something oh sorry June that was that was me again Rachel um I was just going to say that you know she almost presents China a few different ways, right? She's kind of motherly, but then she's also a fighter. Um, and she's still an animal, um, you know, in terms of we're not going to bring her in the house. Um, and I almost felt like that's how she portrayed a number of the characters in the story as well. Mm -hmm. That, you know, they're all multifaceted and, you know, nothing's, nothing's really black and white. Um, you know, there's different sides. Did anyone have a theory of why Ward decided to make China a white dog? I will say that I have not come to terms with that. And the critics talk about when China leaves at the end, you know, she floats away on the current of the hurricane, the water, floodwaters. And they said something like, well, that's expelling whiteness. And I don't know what to make of that. I would maybe want to come to the idea of the bone um, and the way there's, I think, again, towards the end, it was sort of like they're bound together by bone and family and um, and that China as, oh, and if I think China is made from bone or there is bone China, right? So that right, it has right. actually okay. ground bone in it. So I might connect it more with that. Um, as opposed to maybe like thinking about Toni Morrison and whiteness and the literary imagination. Right. I'm not saying that's not necessarily there. I think that's part of the complexity, but um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm, gl I'm glad to hear that other people were a bit puzzled too, because I haven't really, I haven't really resolved that. Um, she certainly stands out from all the other other dogs, in some sense, there's something kind of um, if we if we can 
separate it from from race. There's something kind of bright about her um, in, in the midst of this kind of gritty, dirty environment. But um, I, I'm not sure what to do about that. But I'd like the fact that everybody you've been mentioning how sometimes she's she's she uh, feeds her puppies and cares for them. And other times she is destructive and doesn't seem to want them around at all. And um, and even kills the, the one puppy that might have become the best pit bull to sell for Skeeta. Um, how about. Um, and that's another dimension of China, of course, is she's supposed to be a financial investment to help finance Randall's um, baseball or camp. So no, well, basketball camp, sorry, basketball camp. So um, we've talked a little bit about Mama as a nurturant guide. The page I've highlighted here is the page where she's teaching uh, Esh how to find the eggs and the, the chicken eggs that you, you, you look, but you don't look and how mama is always um, nurturant and um, knowledgeable. She's patient, she's loving, and of course she's not there. So this is her memory, their, their memory of her. Um, and the very important passage in the, when they're huddling in the attic during the hurricane, when um, Ash says to Skeeta, do you remember her? Do you remember her last words? So you can see that there's a lot of grappling with the fact that the, the mother is not there. Um, um, Ash and this rejection of Manny, I think everybody probably felt this was kind of a triumphant scene. Um, I'd like to hear your response. This is where um, Ash actually attacks Manny and perhaps she behaves most like Medea in that scene. Does anybody want to comment on that? This is where her fierceness, Ash's fierceness comes out resembling uh, Medea. The, um, throughout the novel, we've seen kind of the love-hate relationship that Medea and Jason, Medea has with Jason, same relationship or very similar. Esh has that with Manny. She's highly attracted to him. He's her kind of first love, but but she also um, knows very well that she can't really have him. And that and, and um, we, throughout the novel, we see that he doesn't really want her. He just wants to use her. But here she actually attacks him. What did anybody want to comment about the significance of that? My students, by the way, were saying yes with that, <laughs> with that scene. And that was a day when we happened to not have any male students in the class. So it was really interesting how involved and excited the, the women, the students got in the class because they were furious with Manny and his, um, basically the rape scene in the bathroom and the gym at the, at the elementary school. Um, but this is where she rejects him. Um, what I found really interesting is later on when when the whole family becomes more aware that yes, Esh is pregnant, um, that uh, um, Randall says, I will, I'm going to, you know, beat him up. And Esh says, no, I've already done it. So she's she's taken matters into her own hands here, too. Um, 219, Ash wonders if she can protect the baby inside her, her growing awareness of her motherhood. Uh, does she want this baby? Um, uh, could she protect the baby? Um, is And will the baby live? Um, she's trying to, she did consider an abortion, but she doesn't have the money for it and a way to get anywhere to, to have one. Okay, and let's, I, I do want to look at this pa passage, 255. This is um, the hurricane as, as a murderous mother. So if we could just replay that. Okay, this is 255. This is um, Ash kind of thinking about the hurricane the day after. Um, I will tie the glass and stone with string, hand the shards above my bed, 
hang them up on my bed so they will flash in the dark and tell the story of Katrina, the mother that swept into the Gulf and slaughtered. Her chariot was a storm so great and black, the Greeks would say it was harnessed to dragons. She was the murderous mother who cut us to the bone, but left us alive, left us naked and bewildered as wrinkled newborn babies, as blind puppies, as sun-starved, newly hatched baby snakes. She less, left us a gulf, dark, a dark gulf and salt-burned land. She left us to learn to crawl. She left us to salvage. Katrina is the mother we will remember until the next mother with large, merciless hands committed to blood comes. And I think that that passage truly complicates um, our vision of, of motherhood. Um, there were a lot of key words. When I teach this novel, we do a lot of close reading and you can see how important um, many of the words are there in that passage. But um, let us move on to the next question. Um, Rachel, could you shift to the next screen, please, since you are controlling it now? There we go. Okay. Nope, not that one. One back, please. Here we go. The title of the novel um, is a directive, Salvage the Bones. Um, you could read it as someone telling them to do that. Um, and in its individual words, salvage or rescue or save something from harm, save it before it's too late. We get that urgency. And bones, uh, what is left over, the bare structure, bodies, death. And so we've got this great literal and symbolic meanings, um, which are all part of, I think, social words, social themes. And if we look at the passages throughout the book, we, we see other words, um, debris, detritus. Um, so what impressions are you getting about the, um, about the setting? and the environment, the, the, the quality of the life, and also the resourcefulness of the uh, characters. Would anybody like to comment on any of those? Uh, Kristen, you seem to have done some really strong, close reading of this text. Yeah, I, I have taught this text before. Sorry, I joined oh. late and then I was having some internet co connection problems. So, and and um, feel free, anyone else, if you want to jump in. Um, I love talking about this book. <laughs> uh, and I love this question. It reminds me too, I was, it, it's, I, uh, it's sort of like someone, I mean, it kind of presents, um, uh, you know, someone's trash is, an, you know, is another person's treasure and that it asks us to kind of rethink the idea of the, the family's poverty and, and, and the potential. And I, I'll just go back to the passage that, you know, you were talking about previously at the end where um, Ash takes the you know, garbage, basically the pieces from the hurricane, you know, glass, stone, string, shards, uh, and she creates art from it. She creates a mobile, uh, maybe for her baby that, um, you know, will be born. And so, um, and there's a moment like that earlier too, where she goes to the place where they kind of throw their trash and like the glass sparkles, you know, it's as beautiful as the natural. In fact, it's maybe even more beautiful <laughs> than the natural environment. So this idea that there isn't beauty in this landscape or that um, it's uh, just, you know, like a bunch of junk in the yard um, shows that this there's this kind of ethic, um, but also a kind of artistry. Um, in how Ward is asking us to kind of re-see um, uh, folks that particularly uh, get stereotyped in very negative ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that, thank you for mentioning that it becomes a, a piece of art, a piece of memory, of her memory. Um, the One of the critics that I was, I cited talked about recycling as kind of like um, Toni Morrison's re-memory. 
and that those two ideas are how do you you know the past is in the present and that um I think I think we could really talk about that and ponder that for a long time but I thought that was really interesting because uh Esh is weaving together memories of her mother and the her experiences and of course her growing awareness of her own pregnancy but the um you know what can they um save what can they repurpose what can they so i the point you made about both the poverty and that that they have the power to make it into something else so that i think ward never wants to leave these people to have an impression that they're just completely helpless that they are totally just victims but that they are agents too and i think um, the passage you pointed out really shows that so thanks Kristen. Um, why don't we, that should have been 218, by the way, I don't know what the world happened there, but, um, let's go to, um, Rachel, could you give me the next screen, please? Okay. As a survivor of Hurricane Katrina herself, Jasmine Ward has commented that she wanted to humanize, humanize the people who chose to or simply had to stay in their homes in the face of the hurricane, people who were dismissed by the public as foolish, lazy, ignorant, who had no money or means to evacuate. Um, how well do you think she accomplishes her goal of telling their story and evoking understanding for them? How does she elicit um, what scholar theorist Susan, Suzanne Keen calls um, empathic? How does she use empathic narrative techniques to elicit our understanding, identification, and empathy? Um, and I, I, for me, as I read this again, I noted I mean, she, this is a risky novel. This is a gritty novel. Um, we've got dirt and decay and injuries and blood. Think of the various people who are cut from the initial cut that um, when, when Esh is washing the bottles in the beginning and she cuts herself, her hand. We've got Skeeta who crawled through that window and that the farm that the white people have, the, the barn to get the um, parvo medicine. Um, we've got, um, and he gets kind of shredded, his stomach gets cut up. We've got, of course, China's injuries. And then probably the most horrific was when daddy's fingers get caught in the grill and ripped off. Um, so we could just have kind of a, um, we as kind of reading from our white positionality of comfort, um, we could be kind of repulsed by this and yet I think that um, Ward creates something actually very opposite of that. So would anybody want to comment how the first person narrator also contributes to this as one of these empathic narrative techniques? Um, how did that work for you? The fact that Esh is telling her own story. Where do you feel particular connection with her? about Sarah have you taught this novel um no um I'm been teaching English one but English two I teach to a theme and about how the past <laughs> impacts the present so um, and I'm writing a book called three steps about Native Americans in Wisconsin and Minnesota so this is very extremely helpful right now so mm, good uh, yes so my book is called three three steps. It's an interpretation of a past dream and how it impacts the main character who is working with Native Americans in the school that she is um, employed as a school psychologist. So. Hmm. That sounds interesting. <laughs> so hopefully. So thank you for asking. It's, I think that the whole idea of um, Rememory, or as Esh telling the story herself, that's a way of empowerment mm -hmm. that she's able to, um, you know, she's claiming things. She is she is sharing her view with us. Um, we see her describing herself on page seven. Also, it comes across that she's very literary, that she's she's smart. Um, she has a weakness. She 
has a very strong sex drive, but, um, but even that is a form of empowerment for women. It's not just that she's used, she is a participant. Um, how about, let's see, and of course, the, her response to Ma Manny, um, how would you say she describes him? I see a big smile there, Kristen. <laughs> he's, he's the golden boy. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, I when my students uh, talk about him, I'm, I think they describe him, you know, as like like the guy that that the you know the girls like. He's the bad boy, the one that yes. you're not supposed to like. Um, uh, versus Big Henry, who is you know, the, like represents more of that sort of stability, and, but he's not the like bad boy. He's not that, he doesn't have that sort of risk factor. Mm -hmm. um, although um, I think it's interesting that Ward doesn't have them, you know, she she's, you know, Ash says doesn't have a daddy um, and that, you know, maybe she'll get together with Big Henry, maybe she won't, um, but she has her community there um, more so. I think that's the clear message at the end for me. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe like there's so many things that I don't relate to because Ash's experience is so different uh, than mine. And so to me, it's, I think it's, but it's through that first person narration and the various references that Ward draws from, you know, from all over culture that, you know, really bring me in um, and have, you know, have me thinking about who is this young girl and oh, what is her experience? What is her life like? Um, so I don't know, I don't know a lot about empathy, <laughs> um, you know, techniques or theory that's, um, uh, but, for me, it's the way that the story, I think it's through the 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 way that Ward writes uh, and that description that comes through this young girl's uh, story that draws me in and bridges that gap between, um, you know, what I might, ex you know, might expect uh, for a character um, like Ash or what I would draw from in terms of trying to relate it to my own experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that um, this book has been banned in some places and all the book banning that's going on. Um, South Dakota, I think, is the place that banned it um, for its sexuality, the too sexual for, for young people, not a good model. Um, and that doesn't really, with all the book banning going on, that's not really too surprising. But yeah, the way that um, I that that Esh tells us in great detail, one of the empathic narrative techniques is using imagery, using sensory details, really trying to put readers into the scene, which we would think, well, don't all good writers do that? But I think that um, that we have an intensified version of that in this text, and the um we see that when Esh is you know taking care of um of Skeeta's wounds we see that um, just throughout the whole the whole novel um what do you think about the use of present tense I always note what narration is really important um narrative point of view and also the use of present tense for me it gives some kind of immediacy to the action did did other people feel that too Rachel, I see a little nod from you. A little nod? <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, Jim. Having I'm not getting off of mute as as quickly as I can when I'm not screen sharing, but um, but yes, I I did notice the change of tense, and especially that scene where Ash is running with Skeeta. I kind of felt like I was on the edge of my my seat um, during that that whole scene. And the um. Another one, of course, is the moment-by-moment -moment description of the hurricane. Um, that is just 
I think that's for me, this is now moved to the top of, of most powerful moments in fiction. Really, um, It's way up there. And the um, their realization that they can't stay in their house, the house is flooding, the roof is blown off. Um, they have to get they have to move and they have to move from across the tree, the trees to get to the grandparents house, which is a little bit higher ground. Um, but it's just the whole action there of what everybody is doing, how they're trying to save each other. Um, this is page uh, 235. The water swallows and I scream. My head goes under and I'm tasting fresh and cold salt water. Salt somehow the way tears taste. The babies, I think. I kick extra hard like I'm running race and my head bobs above the water. because she's, she's in danger of drowning here. And um, this, of course, is for me, one of the climactic scenes, um, because it's where Skeeta has to make a big decision. Could we see, um, Rachel, could we please see the next screen? Okay, yes. So here we have um, the very powerful creation of, of loving human bonds and the, to survive the theme of how even this low socioeconomic status structural racism that against these these powerful forces that try to keep these people um, from being happy, from basically surviving at all, uh, that yet the, the bonds and they help each other um, is really important. I found there was a really interesting point that um, just a quick line that, that Esh says, Randall has not put Junior down. She's been carrying him the whole time during the the hurricane, and that's the the love, the nurturance there for is really powerful. We're totally recasting male roles, I think. Um, and we talked about the bandaging of Skeeta's stomach, um, and then Skeeta's decision to to rescue Ash and let China go, um, and very big decision. And of course, he feels like he's let China down, and he. But Ash says, "But you, we were there for us." Um, I think you've already, I think, uh, Kristen, you already mentioned Big Henry's declaration at the end. Um, I, that powerful line that that um, when when uh, Esh will not talk, say who the father is, although most people know when, man, anyway, uh, it should be 255, sorry about that, that um, Manny has completely rejected her and denied his, his fatherhood. And, but, um, uh, 255, Big Henry says, you wrong. Um, this baby got a daddy, Esh. He reaches out his big soft hand, soft as the bottom of his feet probably, and helps me stand. This baby got plenty daddies. And to me, that's one of the, uh, the greatest lines here in this. Um, the hope that she will, um, you know, have a life even as a young teen mother. I also found that daddy's concerned for Esh, that he he wants her to get care. He wants to know she's healthy, the baby's healthy. Having lost his wife in childbirth, he is particularly now interested in helping his daughter. Although, even though no one seemed to be there for her to guide her as she was growing up, um, but he is very concerned about her. And that the image that even though they have almost nothing at the end, that they will rebuild together. Um, would anybody like to comment on that? We have a... Um, this is a very harsh um, harsh ending in that they that picture I showed you with everything completely flat and completely destroyed. Um, the they, Baptiste have their property, but now they have no house. Um, they Can they salvage it? Can they rebuild it? We don't... We don't know, they will try, um, but the human community is strong here. Okay, let's do- if we I, I thought the ending was very hopeful, actually. Okay. After all okay. of that destruction, you know, the fact that, um, I think it was Big, Big Henry's mother, I might be mistaken, says, well, at least you're alive, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and they still had a place to go. Mm -hmm. um, and they were coming together as a community. And um, I, I was happy that the father's response 
um, when he learned about the baby was of compassion and care. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I did think after all of that destruction that it was a hopeful ending. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And notice that that hope does not come from daddy had said earlier, well, the FEMA will help, the Red Cross will help. No, they were not helpful in New right. Orleans. They contributed to the problem and they left people uh, stranded. They did not supply help. Um, so it's clear that if they are going to survive, they have to do it themselves. They have to find that strength within themselves and with each other. So I agree with you, Rachel. I think it's actually a very strong ending, um, but it still is a powerful critique of who's not helping. You know, who's not there for these people? Who cares about rural uh, Mississippi? Nobody seems to be. You know, it's they're just not. They're they're they've been kind of abandoned, just the way the people in New Orleans were, basically abandoned. Even though it became kind of a police military state. Could, could we look at one more screen then, please? We're almost out of time, boys. I just want to say, because you mentioned tense, I just noticed how much the last couple of paragraphs are all in, um, you know, like the future, this will oh. happen, this will, this will. So it changes from the, you know, like this present to like this prediction of, of what will happen in the future. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. I think that is. So I think the, that and we, we, of course, throughout do have some past tense when when Esh is recalling or, or her mother remembering those. But yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Looking to the, that's a way to indicate the hope, I think, in the, the future, the, the hope. Um, so those of you who've taught this or who are wanting to teach it, um, I was teaching it within the context of climate fiction. And um, some people could say, yeah, but, you know, just it's Hurricane Katrina. There's no discussion of global warming. There's no discussion of the, the weirding weather that we've, of course, had more and more and more and more of. Um, and so how is this is this a book of climate fiction in your mind? Do you think so? Kristen, you think so? Yes. <laughs> like you, I've taught it as a climate fiction novel. Oh, OK, novel. OK. <laughs> so, um, but I think there are a couple moments, you know, where they talk about how like this hasn't happened in a long time. So there's maybe hints at some of the, that this is a different kind of hurricane um, or that the weather is somehow, you know, different. Um, but I just think words, words definitely an environmental writer. Mm -hmm. um, so um you know maybe it depends on someone's definition of climate fiction but i think it's pretty hard right now to write a contemporary novel <laughs> that's set in a real you know setting and um with to to not place it within that context um and i think it's a really important novel uh, i would be curious to hear what other ones you assigned in your class oh, okay. um, because i think sometimes uh writers of color uh don't necessarily get their fair shake <laughs> uh, you know like it, it tends to be a lot of white writers um who we associate with climate fiction okay i'll just i'll read you the i started off with nonfiction with the robin wall kimmerer's braiding sweet grass because I wanted to, to get an um, indigenous perspective. And I also wanted to get the, um, the, the tool, the way, the mentality, the behavior, the values that could possibly save our environment, save us, that Kimmer gets across and her love for the land. Um, I, then I moved to Mbolo Mumbui's How Beautiful We Were, which was published in 2021. Um, she is from uh, Ghana, I believe, and she's a, but she's an American citizen. Um, um, and then Amitabh Ghosh's Gun Island. I don't know if you know him. He's uh, he's also written a book, The Great Derangement, talking about that's nonfiction and theory, talking about you know why don't we pay more attention in fiction to the climate, um, and how does it get kind of uh, absorbed into more middle class, upper class um, views of the land when really 
we need to be seeing who is affected most by climate change. And then I read, uh, we read Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, um, which is also one of those gritty, harsh texts. And the whole environment's kind of fallen apart. The whole society has fallen apart. And they're moving people to privatized communities to just, you know, have water, to have food, to survive, have jobs. Um, and then I ended with uh, Cherie uh, Demoline's The Marrow Thieves, um, which is very apocalyptic, very scary, very futuristic. And so is, of course, Parable of the Sower, although we're kind of there, sadly, with Octavia Butler. What's going on is not too far from what she was talking about. But um, Cherie Demoline is, is the, the premise there is that um, after the apocalyptic collapse, the environmental collapse, the social collapse that went with it, that the, um, of the United States and Canada, um, that um, the white people are been so stressed out and that they have lost their capacity to dream. And they believe that they can tap the marrow of indigenous people to get their dreams back. I mean, we, we and so, um, yeah, that Sarah, that might, you might, do you know this book? Do you know this book? Sorry, I just wrote this down because yes, mine is the interpretation of a dream and, and it involves Native Americans. And I was gonna do three seasons, but after talking to a few people in the entertainment industry out here, they suggested focus on one. So it's summer and it'll end on the fall, Thanksgiving. So it's important when it ends, so yes. Well, the, the Marrow Thieves is actually was rewritten for young adults, but it teaches extremely well with college students. Um, it's really frightening. And so is the sequel to it um, is very, very frightening. The idea is that the mission schools, the schools have become these places. Recruiters go out and trap the Native Americans, bring them into the schools and then force them subject, you know, force them to to give them the marrow. And of course, they die when they, when they do that. So how how do people escape the the these schools and how do um, they avoid getting in them if they can. So, um, yeah, it was, I, uh, my students wrote about, since it was a, uh, my class was across hybrid writing studies and literary studies. And so we did discussion posts, more post reading type thing every week on every novel. Um, they wrote a personal essay about their relationship to place and loss, particularly about when loss is happening faster with the uh, with with climate change um you know what's happening and most people had some one one um young woman she grew up in medford oregon and the terrible fires mm -hmm. there and how that has you know ruined destroyed uh, parts of that valley but also um really destroyed the quality of the air the world that she knew um someone else wrote about um, her father lives in alaska and she went up there and she saw the salmon dying because the water's too hot. And she also found a big piece of, of a glacier, a giant block of ice that was on one of her favorite pebble beaches that she would go to. And the evidence right there that the glaciers are melting. Um, I'm sure I will teach an assignment like this in this year, um, partly because I'm, I'm trying to tap their own experiences um, and partly because I'm I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm concerned about chat GPT being used in, in ways to kind of short circuit the real thinking. So I want them to um, invest in their own experiences and make connections to the environment. And with the idea that if we care enough about our environment, we will act with social for social justice. And because I teach at SU, we have a Seattle University, which is a Jesuit school. We can talk about those things pretty upfront, which is kind of nice. Um, but I think every place could probably. Um, do you have any other comments? I'm interested in in people. Um, we haven't heard. I haven't heard from a couple people there. Well, and maybe we have time for one more comment. But I know we're a little bit over James. I want to be respectful of, of yeah, your time yeah, and yeah. everyone else's time too. Well, if anybody has comments, maybe you can channel them through um, Rachel. And I'd love to hear uh, if 
I appreciate the comments you've made about, you know, how you teach this book. And um, it sounds to me, uh, Kristen, that your students really enjoyed, really got a lot out of this book, Salvage the Bones. Yes, it was one of their favorites um, out of the selection that we read. Yeah. What other books did you read? Um, let's see. Uh, we also read Braiding Sweetgrass uh, and Parable of the Sower and um, Louise Erdrich's uh, Future Home of the Living God. Yes, yes. And uh, Chang Ray Lee's On Such a Full Sea. Hmm, I don't know that one. Um, it is set in a future Baltimore. Hmm. Um, and a bit like Parable of the Sower has um the world that's created has these sort of um sort of there's a certain amount of walled communities some are like um like factory towns and then there's like where the rich people live and then there are these wild open counties mm -hmm. um so it's a bit of a mix if i had to compare it to things like the road plus parable of the summer uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. a bit uh, but set on the east coast um so i kind of wanted to get not only kind of a mix of authors but um you know kind of look at different regions in the U in the us it was based on i was looking specifically at us kind of based climate fiction mm. well thank you for that title i'll check that one out and on such a full c that was the name of it on yes and c is s e a Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's also a C illness. So I think the title plays um, with, you know, is playing a bit uh, with that reference. Mm. There's part of the problem you may know is that some of the books like um, um, the, the Ministry for the Future is Robinson's book super long. It's so long you could never get students through it. So um, I thought of teaching the Council of Animals. Um, I can't tell you who the the author is right now. That's a short book, but it's a weird book. <laughs> so it was so weird that I didn't know if students would like it or not. Um, but I might teach that one. Again, it's you know after the destruction of everything. Um, so. The animals are the ones who are in charge. So, so and thank you for your ideas. Uh, Rachel, I'll turn this back to you. And um, uh, Sarah, you had your hand up. Did you have a? I would, when you mentioned animals, um, my book also incorporates, I, I grew up with horses. So um, oh. <laughs> my dad had me started riding thoroughbreds bareback in the middle of winter in Minneapolis. Um, and I've had my own horses out here, but um, any books on horses by any chance? Horses, okay. I'll be looking and thinking. Horses. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see the horses in your in your image on your wall too. Oh yes, I have lots around here. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for your ideas. I love to talk about books that are really mo moving to us and important for us, I think, to know about and for our students to know about too. Well, and, and my thanks as well to everyone that joined and for all of your thoughtful comments and participation. And June, I can't thank you enough for preparing for this and hosting this. Um, this was my favorite book this summer that I read. So mm. thank you for suggesting it. Um, and thank you for, for hosting today. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. I thoroughly enjoyed this. So have a good rest of your summer, everybody. Yes, and a good start to the next semester. Yeah. yeah. Okay, bye everybody. Bye. Bye.